of London. These are the bridges, the buildings, the parks. These are the people. These are the symbols that protect them. The Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, Westminster Abbey, and an aging stone building on which justice proudly stands. The London Central Criminal Court, better known as the Old Bailey, where the children of the poor are defended and the wrongdoer is punished. My name is Tom Reed, Detective Superintendent, Criminal Investigation Department, Scotland Yard. My partner is Detective Sergeant George Chappell, about as eager as they come. It was a Monday after a long weekend, and I hadn't been back in the yard ten minutes when the radio report came in. The body of a girl had been found floating in the Thames. George and I were assigned to the case. After three days in the country, I wasn't particularly in the mood for murder. But it didn't have to be. It might be suicide or just an accident. Our destination was Richmond, a kind of traditional London district of small shops and narrow streets that appealed to the tourist trade. We made good time. It wasn't more than an hour after the body of the girl had been found by a local constable that we were driving down to the Thames Embankment. examination by the police surgeon established that the girl had been dead for several hours. Although there were no visible signs of violence, all labels and identifying marks had been removed from the girl's clothing before she was found. Routine investigation of the case was left in the hands of the local police. I sent the body to the laboratory at Scotland Yard for detailed examination. Well, there's no doubt about it. She was struck on the head by a heavy object. Night before last, probably general contusions about the face. She was dead before she hit the water. So it was murder. Even in my business, it was an ugly word. What sort of case would this one be? Would the solution elude us for weeks, months, or even forever? There was very little to go on. An unopened package of cigarettes and a wallet-sized photograph of the victim, which were found in the pocket of the girl's jacket. Nothing else. Nothing, sir. Had your breakfast? No, but I could eat a horse. Oh, let's go and get some. Morning, sir. Morning, Swopes. Pictures of the dead girl. The photographic lab was on his toes. They'd already made an enlargement of the photograph found in the girl's pocket. Pretty little thing, eh, sir? Well, pretty isn't the word. Swopes, please. That's evidence. I'm oh, sorry, sir. All we've got here. Thanks. What about the press? Well, no release on this one yet, Swopes. Not for 24 hours at least. If we don't come up with anything by then... Right, sir. Oh, coming? Yes. Well... Well, what is it, sir? Well, look. Well, straight cuts. She smoke the same brand as you do. What of it? Look again. Hers has a dot after the name. Mine doesn't. Well, I wonder what that means. I don't know. Sort of interesting, isn't it? So? So, let's find out where the office is and see what they have to say about it. Oh, I don't like eating breakfast anyway. At the Straight Cuts office, we learned about the dots. It was a key mark printed on a run for distribution in areas where the firm suspected price cutting. The run was limited to Richmond, the district where the girl's body was found. Within an hour, I was back in Richmond. I had asked the yard for help. Twelve men were assigned, and I briefed them on the problem and all the known facts. We were to scour the area in an attempt to tie two bits of evidence together. A package of straight-cut cigarettes, a brand in common use that I smoke myself, and a picture of a girl, a beautiful girl. And so it began. Wherever cigarettes were sold, there we showed the dead girl's picture and asked the same question over and over again. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, madam. Have you seen this girl before? And back came the same answer, place after place. Sorry? No. We had started with some hope. 
After all, this was no ordinarily attractive girl. Hers was a face which, once seen, was impossible to forget. Something about it was a striking mixture of imperious pride and haunting tenderness. But as time passed, what little hope we had faded away completely. But it was all we had to work on. So we kept going. And going. Yes, gents, what can I do for you? Police officers, Scotland Yard. Oh. Sorry, the matter. We have a picture here we'd like to show you. It's of a girl who might have come in here to buy cigarettes at some time or other. You really mustn't expect me to recognize her, you know. There's so many people come in and out. Oh, well, this is an unusually beautiful girl. It wouldn't be easy not to notice her. Uh, you really mustn't expect... You know her? Yeah, it's Pat Simmons. Leo sees her from time to time. Who's Leo? My son. He works over at Henry's, just down the street. Thanks. Would you mind coming along with us, sir? We'd like to talk to Leo. What about? What's happened to Pat? She's been murdered. How well did you know her, Leo? Not very well. Uh, not very well at all. Mr. Willis, if you will, sir, let him answer. Oh, sorry. Just trying to be of help. Was she your girlfriend? Well, I suppose so, but she'd only give me a break when there was nobody else. Did you see her often? Oh, about once every two or three weeks. It wasn't easy to make a date with Pat. She was very independent. She, she didn't care. In fact, sometimes I think she, she didn't care about anybody or anything. When did you see her last? Oh, about a week ago. I forget when exactly. Do you work here at nights, too? Oh, yes, sir, Leo. Yes, sir. Yes, well, we're sorry to have bothered you. Oh, uh, incidentally, do you know where Miss Pat Simmons lived? Oh, yes, sir, just over the road, Farrington Court. She used to live with a friend, Jenny Alston. Thank you, Leo. You've been very helpful. Yes? Miss Jenny Elston? Yes? We're police officers. We're uh, sorry to bother you, but may we come in? Yes, please do. What is it? Is there something wrong? We understand a young lady named Pat Simmons was a friend of yours. Something's happened to her. Yes. Something dreadful? I'm afraid so. Oh, no. No. Now, please, sit down. I realize this is not going to be easy for you, but there's some questions about Miss Simmons we have to ask. Perhaps you can give us the answers. Not now. Please, not now. I'm afraid it has to be. It's urgent. You see, your friend was murdered. Murdered? But who would? Oh, no, I can't believe it. Nobody would do such a thing. Why, she was the sweetest, kindest... Evidently, someone thought otherwise. Who did it? We don't know. Perhaps you can help us. Now, when did you see her last? Oh, about two nights ago. Well, that wasn't unusual. She often stayed away. Do you know anyone who might have had a reason to hate her? No. She had a lot of gentlemen friends? Yes. Did you know who they were? No, I never interfered. Her life was her own. Do you know her Leo Willis? Why, yes. What do you know about him? Oh, nothing much. He's, he's just a silly, infatuated boy. Silly? How? Well, he was jealous of Pat's other friends. He wanted her all to himself. All she was doing was trying to be nice to a lonely boy. But he took it so seriously. Seriously enough to have killed her? No. No, I don't think so. Jealousy is one thing, but murder's another. Well... Oh, incidentally, what kind of cigarettes did Miss Simmons smoke? Pat? Why, she didn't smoke at all.
Hello, Mr. Willis. Hello. Sorry to trouble you again, but we'd like to talk to your son. Leo? Leo's at work. Mr. Willis. We've just been to the espresso bar. They told us he came home. Like he did two nights ago, complaining of a headache. Oh, no chance. The night before last, Leo was at work. He wasn't here. Your son lied to you, Mr. Willis, just like he did at work when he told them he was coming home. Well, maybe he had a reason. What of it? Pat Simmons was killed two nights ago. Willis was booked on suspicion of murder. When George and I questioned him the following morning, the suspect stubbornly protested his innocence and repeatedly denied any knowledge of the girl's death. Believing that an innocent man doesn't generally resist arrest, we asked Leo the same questions over and over again in the hope that somehow some slip of the tongue might give us the clue we needed. And that's the way it happened. George stumbled onto it by mentioning the boy's father. Ah, oh, you're wasting your time. Leo doesn't care how his father feels. What do you mean, make a remark like that? If you cared, you'd clear yourself. And you can only do that by telling us the truth. No matter how difficult it may seem, the truth has an odd way of being believed, Leo. You'll be surprised. Go on, Leo. I hated Pat. I guess just because I was crazy about her and she kept standing me up in that selfish way of hers time after time. Three nights ago, I must have had a date with her. I got out of work, you know how, and I went over to her place. She was just leaving with somebody else. She said she'd explain later, and then she and this chap got in a car and drove off. Go on, Leo. Well, I just went walking, killing time until she got back. But the more I walked, the angrier I got. Do you know whom she went out with? Well, no, she wouldn't tell me his name, but I saw him. What did he look like? Poor oh, elderly chap. Rich, you could tell that right off. He had a large car. It shouldn't be hard to find out who he is. How? I wanted a nice name, too. I wanted to face him one day and tell him to keep his hands off my girl. So I took a good look at his license number. What was it? Y-A-A-337. Did you see her later? Yes, I waited outside her place. He came up, dropped her off, and then went on. She seemed surprised to find me waiting for her. She seemed terribly upset, angry even. She wanted to get rid of me, but I wouldn't budge. 
She knew the only way she could get rid of me was to go out with me for a bit. She didn't want to, but, well, she, she had to. Where did you take her, Leo? I, I took her to a... Leo, the truth. To the old deer park, Leo. Go on, Leo. Yes. What happened there? I wanted somewhere where we could walk and talk, but the more I talked, the more she got angry. I was wasting her time, she said. There was something more important she had to do. She didn't say what. I got very angry, and I, I hit her with my fist. I hit her twice here. I didn't mean to do it. I, I wasn't myself. She, she fell, and then I came to my senses. She, she, she got up half dazed, but... Instead of going to help her, I... I turned and ran. But I didn't kill her. I didn't. Let me ask you this. If you're so convinced that Leo is our man, if he's gone this far in his confession, why doesn't he go the whole way and tell it all? I don't know, George. There's something about him. Something that smacks very much of the truth. Confused, frightened, but the truth. You're going to burn a hole in that thing. Not that I blame you. What kind of a girl was she? Well, according to Leo, she was hard, selfish, inconsiderate. Miss Elson found her the kindest person who ever lived. Reed? Yes? They found the owner. Yes, yes, I'm ready. Go ahead. You sure? Well, thank you. What is it there? Hugh Stribling. A Stribling Associated Banks? Wow. Miss Simmons gets more interesting by the minute. Everything from a poor young man in Richmond to one of the richest men in England. Let's go. Something more than fascinating. At the start, I thought her magical and unreal. And that's the way she remained throughout the six months that I knew her. And I admit it needed her. Needed her in a compulsive way. I, I couldn't seem to control it. After I lost my wife, the loneliness set in. Even counterfeit love to a lonely man has something of magic to it. Still, it all ended many months ago. When did you get this, Mr. Stribbing? Three days ago. No return address, just the, just the blackmail letter, unsigned. It instructs you to pay Miss Simmons five thousand pounds for the negative. Yes, I, I had intended to bring the picture of Miss Simmons and myself and the letter to the police, but I thought I could handle it. You know, it's beginning to look as if whoever faked this picture could be the man who killed Miss Simmons. We know, of course, that it is a fake, made up of two negatives. One of you and one of Miss Simmons. Have you any idea who took that picture of you, sir? Of you alone, I mean. I am often photographed at the golf club at my place in the country. I, I wouldn't have any idea. After you received this, you called Miss Simmons and met her. Yes, three nights ago, as I told you, I, I drove her about oh, for two hours, perhaps. I, I accused her, but she convinced me of one thing. She wasn't capable of sinking as low as blackmail. Did she have any idea who might have done it? I'm sure she had. So I did something on my own that might help. Well, what was that? I wanted to know his name, too. So on the pretext of wanting to buy the negative, I handed Miss Simmons a check for 5,000 pounds and told her to hand it over to the blackmailer. She refused, but I insisted, and she took the check. I have a pretty good notion that whoever cashes that check is your murderer. <laughs> But no bank in London reported such a cheque being presented for payment. We were left with only three clues. The type on the blackmail letter, the watermark on the paper, and the postal mark on the manila envelope. It had been mailed from Ealing, a London district directly north of Richmond. The blackmail photograph was still our only real hope. Here we are, sir. Just came up from the lab. Thank you, Swopes. All right, now, Leo. And remember, this is a fake photograph. 
Why, that's the chap I saw her drive off with. Yes. Now concentrate on that half of the picture with Pat in it. Yeah. Have you ever seen that picture of Pat before? It's only part of an original picture, Leo. Think of it as part of some other picture you might have seen. No. Are you sure? Well, I've got some at home that are a bit like this, but not this one exactly. You remember the photographer's name? Well, no. Pat modeled for a lot of different photographers. When there were rejects, she'd give them to me, but the photographers usually destroyed them, she said. Have you got a lot of these rejects, Leo? Well, about a dozen or so at home. Come on, Leo. Some of these are marked with the photographer's names. I know, that means more slogging around from photographer to photographer. Well, it'll be a change from the back in this, anyway. Of course, if all the models are as beautiful as this one, it might be rather pleasant. Ooh. Hold it. Something? Give me the blackmail picture. There we are. What? See that vase on the side table? Yeah. There it is in this one, too. Same prop in both pictures. And there's the photographer's name on the back. It seemed as if our investigation was beginning to pay off. Were we being lucky? Or was it just hard work? The kind of grim attention to detail that finally turns up identical flower vases in two different photographs. Good afternoon, gentlemen. We'd like to speak to the owner, please. Yes, and what's it in connection with? We'll tell that to Mr. Layton, if you don't mind. Mr. Layton? Oh, I see. No, that's just a firm name we carried over from the previous owners. There's no Mr. Layton now. Oh, who is the new owner? The new owner? It's Miss Elston. <laughs> Miss Elston protested her innocence until Stribling's check to Patricia Simmons was found hidden in her apartment. After that, she confessed. The rest was simple. An attempt at blackmail without Pat Simmons' knowledge, the false belief that Pat was a close enough friend and would go along with the blackmail, the fight between the two women, and murder. Justice was served. Justice in the Old Bailey where the people are protected, where the children of the poor are defended and the wrongdoer is punished.